Nick Briscoe. This is my first podcast hosted on my Substack infotainment channel called The Songs The Thing. You can find it there in the section named The Whistle Test. This podcast is a read aloud of a section from a four part article entitled Songwriting Basics Song Structure. This section covers very briefly some of the historical background of songwriting. The read aloud starts with the final paragraph of the introduction. You can find the complete article on my Substack channel in the section called Tin Pan Alley and in the archive section. Enjoy! Songwriting Basics Song Structure Read by Nick Briscoe Historical Background The final element on my list of required songwriting basics is having some knowledge of the historical background of songs and songwriting. Again, this is a massive subject that could only be completely contained within tens, if not hundreds, of huge books. Yet, I think it's a topic worth taking at least a quick dive into, if for no other reason than to experience its enormity and depth. If you only scratch the surface of this topic, you will almost immediately begin to realise the immense cultural importance of its legacy. If you are a songwriter, you will come to understand that you are part of an unbroken global tradition going back millennia, most probably to the dawn of humanity itself. The first thing to say is that I love history. I read history books. I know history is not an exact field. It can be subjectively contentious. And I also know that history is not for everybody. Some people just aren't that interested. The fact remains that almost everybody I've met and read about who has mastered a particular field, whether it be becoming an architect, a racing driver, a surgeon or a songwriter, has been a passionate nerd on that subject. It absolutely fascinates them. Ask a chef who their favourite chef is and why, and most likely you'll be there for hours listening to a reverential, micro-detailed historical account of maybe ten chefs you probably never heard of and all their signature dishes. As I've already mentioned in the introduction, it simply is not realistically possible to attempt a detailed historical account of songwriting. My aim here is to give you a taste to highlight songwriting's cultural significance globally and leave you with a sense of the importance of the songwriting legacy and the positive impact it has had on humanity. Nowadays, we hear a lot of woke, progressive talk about cultural appropriation. I want to state right here and now, I think this concept is a load of bollocks. I'm not going to go into detail here about this and unpick it step by step, partly because I don't need to. Thankfully, Douglas Murray has adeptly done this in his recent book, The War on the West, in chapter four, entitled Culture. What I will say is that historically and currently, syncretization has played and continues to play a major role in most musical cultures from around the world. Syncretism, the merging and blending of different musical ideas from around the world, is nothing new. If you look at any period of musical history, you will find proof of this, of this cross-pollination of cultural ideas across borders and continents and ethnic groups. Countless composers have been inspired by music that they have heard from other cultures, and these new flavours get added to the mix of their repertoire. There are just too many examples of this, almost countless examples, so to pick one becomes difficult. However, because I'm principally interested in songwriting, let's start by talking about John Dowland and use him to exemplify syncretization. Oh, and if someone starts banging on at you about cultural appropriation, just tell them to go and learn a new word. Go look up syncretism in a dictionary. John Dowland, 
1526 to about 1626. Dowland was a late Renaissance composer, probably English, also could have been Irish. Stated most simply, he was a royal court composer, for example, for the Danish royal court. But he also had a side gig, publicly publishing his music in books. His main instrument was lute. He was a virtuoso lutenist. Guitar-like instruments, similar to those we know today, had just started to come into existence in Spain, but was still not really a thing. I think if Dowland were alive today, he'd probably have taken to the electric guitar, and judging by what he wrote for lute, I think he would have easily been able to shred with the best of them. I imagine he would be something like Brian May of Queen. Lutes are not an English instrument, The history goes back possibly to ancient Egypt or Babylon. So there's a good first example of syncretisation, as originally lutes would have been gradually introduced into Europe, and then later they would have arrived in England from mainland Europe. Dowland's side gig developed into him becoming one of the best-known popular singer-songwriters of his day. He wrote and published many airs. An air could be said to be an English song form. Dowland's Flow My Tears is a fantastic example of one. Sting of the police was, and still is, fascinated by Dowland and has recorded many of his works, including Flow My Tears. Have a look for songs from the labyrinth. However, the original idea for Airs came from an Italian song form, the Aria, which itself was part of a larger Italian musical form, namely opera. These operatic arias developed into Baroque da Capo arias, such as Giuseppe Giordani's Caro Mio Ben, My Dear Loved One. Da Capo is Italian for From the Head. This points to the fact that these songs were written in three sections. An A section a B section, a distinctly different section, and then going back to the head, the first A section repeats. These songs were almost all about one topic, love. Many historians believe these da capo arias to be one of the main precursors to modern pop love songs that are based on repeating material, the chorus and the hook. Okay, see how difficult this is. One minute we're in the Renaissance in England. Next, we're a few centuries ahead in Baroque Italy, then present day globally. But it's all relevant to the singer-songwriter historical legacy. Anyway, back in late Renaissance England, probably Dowland, who for his day was a well-travelled man, encountered arias somewhere whilst in mainland Europe. Or it could be that the French version of this song form an air, spelled A-Y-R-E, or A-I-R-E, somehow seeped into England from France. Do you need any more historical proof that syncretisation is a thing and cultural appropriation is not? If you do, then Dowland also wrote songs in ballad form, which originates from a medieval French song form, Ballad. You're still not convinced. Dowland also wrote instrumental pavans. His most famous published work, Lacrimae, or Seven Tears, is a set of seven works based on this slow courtly dance form. There are contemporary examples based on this form from all over Europe, from Italy, Germany, France, Spain. It was probably originally from Italy, from Venice, although some historians think that this slow style may have originated in Spain. Also, Dowland was interested in Italian madrigals. This was a vocal and lute secular song form for more than one voice. Dowland went to Italy in the hope of studying this form with the famed madrigal composer Luca Marenzio. 
Although Dowland is often mentioned as being part of the English school of madrigal composers, I don't actually know of any madrigal that he himself composed. Perhaps he is just associated with this school as a famed lutenist, as without doubt he would have performed madrigals written by contemporary English composers, for example William Byrd or Orlando Gibbons or Thomas Morley. You can pick almost any famous composer from any culture, from any time period. If they had access to music from other cultures that inspired them, somewhere you'll find that flavour within their work. I think this really demonstrates that just knowing a little history, just being slightly informed, can diffuse and deflate a lot of the politically correct, progressive, woke nonsense we hear spoken around us today. I think the real question becomes, why has syncretism, this universally accepted historical process of freely incorporating influences and flavours from everywhere and anywhere, suddenly become anathema? There is something deeply troubling behind this idea of cultural appropriation. It has nothing to do with culture. It is deeply political. It is obviously ideological. It is definitely dangerous. It potentially divides people. And that is not what music is about. Music is about uniting people. It's about bringing people together, about connecting them. Music is about connecting with an audience. It's a highly developed and sophisticated form of communication. Those peddling this cultural appropriation concept should be deeply ashamed. My opinion is that we should all embrace the links that music forms between different cultures. Music should not be used as a political platform or a propaganda tool aimed at isolating different cultures and groups from one another. Okay, rant over. However, I really do think it is an important point and it is totally linked with music history. With John Dowland, I went into only a small amount of detail about him, his importance, his work's cultural significance and the depth of the legacy he left, these musical and songwriting gifts we have from him. Perhaps now you begin to appreciate the depth and significance of this topic of the history of songwriting. I want to continue with this now. However, I am really going to try to just briefly skim around the world and through different eras so that you just get the most basic feel for this vast topic. Where to start? Prehistory. We don't know exactly what our ancestors were doing musically. We don't know exactly when or how they first began to make music or sing songs. Or maybe they sang songs before they started making music. We simply just do not know. Anything we say about our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago, sitting around fires at night, making music, dancing and singing is all just guesswork. But for sure, at some point, that's exactly what they were doing. And quite possibly, they consumed certain plants and plant extracts to liven the whole creative process up. Drug-taking musicians searching psychedelically for inspiration is absolutely nothing new. First written musical work of a song. Currently, the earliest known record of any type of written music are on fragments of cuneiform tablets found in what was the ancient city of Ugarit in modern Syria, dating back to approximately 1,400 years before the Common Era, so maybe 3,400 years ago. The most complete of these Hurrian songs is a hymn to the goddess Nikal. The fragment contains information about musical pitches, how to play them, and also some of the words used to make offerings to the goddess. So it's an offering song, sung to Nikal, 
accompanied by a musician, probably on something similar to a lyre, a kind of simple harp. By the way, many historians believe this type of instrument originated in ancient Greece at around the exact date that these cuneiform tablets were made. If this is accurate, then somehow these instruments were culturally appropriated from the Greeks by the Amorite culture in Ugarat, at least 1,000 kilometres away. Just saying. First European written work of a song. There are several contenders for the earliest known written version of songs in Europe. I remember being told about a song written on a piece of parchment that was found inside another book. I think the book and the song were from Visigothic Spain, so from the 6th or 7th century Common Era. But I have searched and searched and I can't find any reference to this anywhere. If anyone knows about it, please do let me know. So, as far as I know, some of the first known popular songs, so songs that were not written for use in some kind of religious setting, written in English are Summer is a Coming In, circa 1240, and Miri It Is While Summer It Last, circa 1220 to 1240. Summer is a Coming In, in modern English, Summer is Coming, is a six-part continuous round. It was handwritten. It predates the introduction of the printing press by about 150 years. Miri It Is While Summer It Last, Miri It Is While Summer Lasts, was handwritten on a fragment of parchment found inside a 12th century religious manuscript known as the Book of Psalms. So maybe this is where the story I heard about the Visigothic song hails from. It sounds very similar. For sure, there will be similar relics from all around Europe, either just before or just after these two examples in English. So popular secular songs in Italian, in German, in French, in Spanish... Just do some searches. I'm sure you'll find something. One example from Spain is the Benedictine monk and Truve, travelling musician, Gautier Coincy, who died in 1236. His book, Les Miracles de Notre Dame, is a manuscript containing a collection of poetry and songs. So based upon the author's death date, his book must have been published before either of the English examples mentioned. Troberitz. Next I'm going to touch on yet another contentious progressive topic. Women and their historical role in music. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole with this topic. All I want to really point to is that, of course, back then, as now, there were amazing female singer-songwriters and composers. I think that the history of songwriting shines some very interesting and revealing light upon this subject. I want to look briefly at the Kingdom of Occitania, also known as Languedoc, in what is now more or less the south of France, during a hundred-year period from about 1150 Common Era to 1250 Common Era. This was the age of the Troberids. Firstly, we need some context, some general context about where the songwriting tradition was in Europe circa 1150, and some more specific context about what kind of culture there was in Occitania at that time. Generally, we can say that throughout Europe, for as much as already 500 years at least, there had been a culture of wandering singers, musicians and entertainers. There are historical records of this from mostly every part of Europe. Some of the singers and musicians were also songwriters. Some of them travelled as part of larger groups, maybe as part of a band of gypsies or some other nomadic groups. Others travelled alone or in a small troop with a handful of companions. Also, we can say that most small settled communities, so villages and small towns, etc., would have had some local musicians and possibly even songwriters. These travelling musicians went by many names. Bards, minstrels, jongleurs, waits, scops, scalds. 
minnesingers, trouvères, troubadours, to attempt to list the types of songs that they performed is too vast a subject for here. The list would have at least 50 different types. Notably, Andalusian flamenco can trace a huge part of its heritage back to this traditional travelling music lifestyle. Add some rag-type, almost melodic percussion and clapping rhythms from India, some microtonal intervals from Arabic North Africa, and some dissonant scales from the Ottoman Middle East. Oh, and of course, also some essence of single melodic lines and or diatonic harmony from Central Europe and Bob's your uncle, flamenco. I have to say it, syncretism. What we can say more generally is that often in these songs, quite often well-known poems or popular legend stories were set to music and then sung. There was also original material, especially written by songwriters. These songs covered a wide variety of topics. However, a key focus was courtly love and its chivalrous pursuit. Imagine a knight on horseback, setting out on a seemingly impossible quest involving performing dangerous deeds, you know, dragon slaying and all the usual stuff, in order to demonstrate and prove his pure, unquestionable love for and loyalty to and obedience to his lady, usually a young, beautiful, noble lady or princess safe at home in her castle. Just one example of a song in this style is the sonnet, which is Italian for little song. All the song types were sung in the local vernacular, not in Latin. Broadly speaking, we can say this tradition, these songs performed by travelling musicians, continues today on many levels, including that it is the basis of almost all traditional and modern folk music. So not much has changed in the last 1,000 years. Then, as today, there was a big gig economy with bands and musicians touring around Europe performing and singing love songs to make a living. More specifically, about Occitanian culture in about 1150 Common Era, we can say that their society and way of life was relatively liberal and relaxed and chiefly focused upon the ideal of courtly love and chivalry. It would seem that in contrast to many other places in Europe, women in Occitania were customarily and legally held in much higher regard. Within noble families at least, many were treated as equal individuals and were able to attain positions of relative power women were also able to choose their own love matches. We know of at least 20 female travelling musicians, Troberitz, who came from Occitania. There survives at least 40 contemporary written versions of songs they wrote or are known to have performed. Of course, there was a much vaster catalogue. However, it was destroyed, and we'll come to that. Significantly, Within Occitanian culture at that time, being a troberitz, a female troubadour, was considered to be a legitimate and acceptable profession and pastime for a woman. Most, if not all, of the troberitz we know of came from noble Occitanian families. Most songs sung by male troubadours and the like were sung in the persona of a knight, In contrast, most of what the Troberitz sang about was from their individual perspective and experience as a woman, seeking love with a man, and their tales and exploits are instantly recognisable to anyone today. Unfortunately, this era of the Troberitz was short-lived. In 1209, Pope Innocent III proclaimed a crusade, the Albigensian Crusade, against these troberitz and troubadour courtly loved up heretics in Occitania. By 1250, all troberitz and troubadours were in exile 
or forced into silence and much of their written musical legacy destroyed. Carmina Burona After this musical inquisition, for the next 50 to 100 years, almost all secular music written in any European local vernacular was forced underground. They then developed a kind of semi-papally approved secular song sung in Latin that could be legally written down and disseminated around Europe. These songs were called Goliards. Many manuscripts of these survive today. The biggest and maybe most well-known collection of these is the so-called Carmina Burana, which in 1935-1936, Karl Orff adapted into an oratorio, a large-scale orchestration by the same name. L'Homme Armé and the Power of Pop. Then as now, during this late medieval period, the church was looking for ways to get bums on seats. Many church patronised composers realised that if they used the tunes from well-known popular songs incorporated into the music they were being paid to write for church services, then the common people would recognise it and would be more likely to attend, participate and stay in church. There were literally hundreds of settings of the ordinary mass that incorporate the tunes from contemporary popular pop songs. One of the best known and most used was L'Homme Armé, French for the armed man. A well-known example of this mass setting was created by the French composer Josquin Desprez in about 1490. Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685-1750 If I start to talk about Bach, I'm likely to never stop. Please just listen to some of his work. That is probably all I need to say. A good place to start would be book one and book two of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Basically, each book contains 24 pieces in every major and minor key for a keyboard, for a clavier. Well-Tempered refers to the tuning. Basically, it's widely believed that the pieces are written to be tuned to what we now consider to be a 12-tone chromatic scale at universal concert pitch, where the note A above middle C is 440 hertz. This is essentially the birth of diatonic harmony and the circle of fifths, which is the basis of almost all Western art music and modern contemporary pop music. Sir George Martin, the main record producer behind almost all of the Beatles songs, was a classically trained musician and a huge fan of Bach. And almost all of his arrangements of the Beatles material have this fact deeply imbued within them, especially anything with orchestral strings and brass. The Beatles themselves were incredibly fast learners and you can hear that their later songs, songs not produced by Sir George Martin, still carry this flavour of bar. Just listen to almost any song from the Beatles and listen to almost any piece of bark and almost immediately you'll begin to spot similarities. OK, I want to leave mainland Europe for now and very briefly look around the world. Japan, as in Europe... From the medieval era, there was an established tradition of travelling musicians who made a living touring around, singing and playing songs. One part of this tradition, which continues up until today, is that of goze, meaning blind woman, which is exactly that, a visually impaired woman who works as a travelling singer-songwriter performer. Java and Bali. Gamelan, what to say, where to start. Gamelan music, the instruments, the sound, the style, the tonality have all had such a huge impact on Western music dating back at least 150 years. Seriously, the list of composers that this astounding tradition has influenced is immense. Debussy, Sati, Bartok, Poulenc, Messiaen, Boulet, Cage, Glass, Reich, 
Britain, just to name a few. And also in, let's say, more avant-garde contemporary modern popular music, we can see a huge influence in the jazz of Don Cherry, Nana's father, in works by King Crimson, the Yellow Magic Orchestra, Robert Fripp and Mike Oldfield, again, just to name a few. And I didn't even begin to mention the film scores that feature Gamelan. New Zealand. I have to be careful here. I don't want to rant too much. There is an amazing composer from New Zealand named Dame Gillian Whitehead. I first encountered her and her work maybe 25 years ago in Sydney. She's of Maori heritage. She's a very accomplished classical composer. She lived and studied in Europe for a long time. As far as I know, she is, or was, involved on some level in several invaluable ethnomusicology projects that focused on collecting and cataloguing indigenous Maori instruments with a particular focus on their history and how they were used and played. The projects shone a light on the unbelievable variety and local variants of instruments, some only existed literally in one Maori settlement, that had been in use, and that they were widely used in a secular context, as well as in a ceremonial or in a ritualistic manner. Some of Dame Whitehead's musical work combines and fuses Maori instruments and musical ideas with classical orchestra and Western art music. I admire her and her work. I think what she does and how she does it is skillful, insightful and valuable. As far as I know, no one in academic circles or from any other woke activist circles is accusing Dame Gillian Whitehead of cultural appropriation. Yet, by their definition, that is exactly what she is doing. A Maori heritage composer using Western art music and instruments, some music and instruments not directly from her own culture. It seems that these progressive accusations of cultural appropriation, which you already know as a concept I think is bullshit, can only be levelled at white-skinned people, which coming from people who claim to be anti-racist is actually totally racist. Russia. It's too vast and too complex a topic to even contemplate covering here. Just for a moment, consider all the different ethnic groups that are included in Russia, with all their deep musical history, spanning from the borders of Europe across to almost Japan and from Mongolia up to the Arctic Circle. For now, I just want to mention a few names, names of Russian composers with, in some cases, some of their notable works. I think they will say it all. Tchaikovsky, his ballets, Swan Lake, The Nutcracker Suite, Sleeping Beauty, Rimsky-Korsakov, Borodin, Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, The Rite of Spring, Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Peter and the Wolf. Oh, and I have to say Balalaika, simply because Kate Bush notably used one on the recording of her 1985 song, Running Up That Hill, which by some strange twist of Netflix serial fate has now gained renewed attention and is back in the top 10 of the UK singles charts this week in June 2022. Africa. It's the same situation as with Russia. Too vast and too complex a topic to even contemplate covering here. The most obvious thing to say is polyrhythms and drumming and the immense impact that has had on musical styles all over the world. I'll come back to this when I get to North America. The other thing I want to say is that there is an incredible historical singer-songwriter culture in almost every corner of this continent. For now, I'm only going to mention one contemporary Senegalese singer-songwriter who came to prominence in the West when he recorded a single with Naina Cherry called Seven Seconds, Yasin Adour. 
He is one of literally hundreds of amazing African contemporary singer-songwriters writing in so many different styles. South America and North America. And so it goes. It's the same situation with both South America and North America. It's simply not possible to cover and do justice to such a vast and complex wealth of indigenous, migrated and locally developed musical and songwriting styles in this whirlwind global songwriter slash musical historical overview. All I can offer is an almost homeopathic dose of the flavour of this treasure, a dose of much less than one part per million. Take, for example, just one song from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil that has become world famous. The melody for The Girl from Ipanema was originally written in 1962 by Antonio Carlos Hobin, 1927 to 1994 a multi-talented multi-instrumentalist Brazilian singer-songwriter the first lyrical version of the song was written in Portuguese by the Brazilian writer poet and lyricist Vinicius de Mores the original version was called Menina que passa the girl who passes by Just in that last sentence, there's a book's worth of material trying to explain what samba rhythms are and how they developed. It's quite simply now a global phenomenon. Samba developed from about 1900 onwards. It's a fusion of African polyrhythm and Brazilian folk music, much of which finds its roots in local indigenous rhythms. It's basically totally infectious dance music. It would be almost impossible to not at least shuffle one foot when good samba percussionists start to play. Bossa Nova is a rhythmic variation of samba that developed in the late 1950s in Rio de Janeiro. More or less, Hobim made this rhythm internationally famous and it is now one of the core rhythms in modern jazz. And there, I said it, jazz a late 19th century music form first developed in New Orleans in the USA, and now it's a global music institution with a vast catalogue of work in a vast array of diverse styles with influences from almost everywhere. Anyway, Hobin was recording in New York and decided to record an English-language version of the song. Norman Gimbel translated and adapted the English version's lyric, and the version was called The Girl from Ipanema. Frank Sinatra recorded a version. So did Ella Fitzgerald. Now the song has become the second most recorded song of all time, the first being Yesterday by The Beatles. Personally, one of my absolute favourite pieces of music from South America is again by a Brazilian composer, Hieto Villa Lobos, 1897-1959. to His prelude number four of a set of five in E minor for guitar, written in 1940, for me, captures the essence of South America. My favourite version is played by the great English classical guitarist Julian Bream. The opening melody has elements of call and response, may be inspired by blues guitar. We're coming back to that. There are also very rhythmic plucked chords, which conjure up for me being deep in a rainforest late at night. The sheet music is subtitled Homenagem ao Indio Brasileiro, Homage to the Brazilian Indian. The blend of Spanish-influenced classical guitar composition, more modern jazz and Blues guitar influences and local rhythms is captivating. Heading northwards towards the US of A, we pass by the Caribbean. And just where to start there? Let's just say Bob Marley, 1945 to 1981, and Jamaican Rasta Reggae, Rihanna from Barbados, one of the best-selling singer-songwriters of all time, 
and bachata music from the Dominican Republic, all a fusion of African rhythms, European musical influences and local folk tradition, all now global sensations. Enough said. When speaking about music from North America, it's impossible not to mention the blues. It's now another global phenomena. I love the blues. I listen to it a lot. There are so many different variations. It's so diverse that to attempt to generalise it is daunting and probably impossible. For me, the two key elements are, firstly, the rock-solid use of rhythm. Just for example, and especially in blues guitar playing, it's all about rhythm. The second key element, and of course it's not true of all blues, is the incredible use of the pentatonic scale and variations of it. It's what gives a lot of the blues that blues flavour. And this flavour has spilled out into contemporary popular music. Just one of probably thousands of examples being Dreams by Stevie Nicks, where the main melody is totally built on pentatonic scales. To be more precise, this song and its melody can be analysed musically in several ways. One is very straightforward, key of C, alternating between the subdominant and dominant four and five chords. But surely the melody doesn't sound major. It's not so happy, happy positive. The opening melodic phrase starts on the note A and returns there a lot to begin new phrases. So maybe the song's melody could be viewed modally, specifically the Aeolian mode. Maybe from this modal perspective, some other modes need to be considered for the analysis of other sections of the song, or maybe not. Or maybe it would be better viewed as being in the key of A minor, with the melody being built on the natural minor scale, which makes the main chords used, F major 7th and G major, chords 6 and 7. So you end up with a minor sounding melody over this very simple progression of just two major sounding chords and chords which are not immediately identifiable as being central to the song's key A minor. Equally, the melody could be viewed as being built on a combination of minor and major pentatonic scales in the keys of either C major or A minor. Viewed from the A minor key perspective, the vast majority of the time during the verse, pre-chorus and chorus, the melody is minor pentatonic, but gradually passing notes from the major pentatonic scale are introduced from time to time. For me, this analysis from the pentatonic perspective makes the most sense, not least because it shines light on the fact that contained within every major and natural minor scale, there are at least six pentatonic scales, three major and three minor. Whichever way you look at it, this melodic ambiguity is hauntingly beautiful, melancholic yet positive, bittersweet, leaving the listener not knowing if to smile or cry. And that, from my perspective at least, is the essence of the blues. One quite viable sounding theory about the development of the blues is that black men working on the construction of the railroads in the USA during the 19th and 20th centuries would have encountered men from Ireland and from China who were also working on this vast transcontinental project. Irish folk music and a huge amount of traditional Chinese music deeply incorporates the use of the pentatonic scale. Play the simple version of that scale and it simply sounds Chinese. It just does. It forms the basis of so much Chinese music. The theory is that these workers would play music in their encampments at night and the influence of Irish and Chinese folk blended with African polyrhythms. Add to that the immense suffering of working on such a railroad gang 
the daily call and response work songs and a background of religious choir singing and hymns and you have some of the key ingredients that gave birth to the blues and from the blues we have rock and roll and all its derivatives rock soft rock prog rock heavy rock heavy metal punk indie on and on and of course there is country and western not to mention soul and Motown and funk and hip-hop and R&B and rap and endless other influential popular styles that have developed in North America and Europe during the past 70 years or so. This popular music culture has spread worldwide and is now part of daily life on every continent. Bands tour globally and a global festival music culture has developed. Think Glastonbury or Burning Man. The truth is, perhaps the first music festivals developed on the Pacific Northwestern seaboard of Canada and the USA, in the areas around Vancouver and Seattle. Prior to the arrival of white settlers, the indigenous tribes there, and there were many, the Haida, the Salish, the Tlingit, the Kwakwakawak, just to name a few, would hold regular gift-giving feasts generically known as potlatch. A potlatch was more than just a feast. It was where key tribal and intertribal decisions were made, where economic deals were agreed, where arguments were settled, where treaties between tribes and family groups were made, where status was endowed or removed. I lived in Vancouver for a while and I spoke with people I met there about these potlatches. This was many years ago, and what I remember of what they told me, well, I can't find any proof or confirmation of it online. So I'm just going to put what I know out there, and maybe someone else can confirm it for me. What I was told is more or less as follows. Maybe once a year, or every couple of years, a tribal chief would more or less expend all of his amassed wealth on organising a potlatch. He would put everything he had stored away and saved up into creating the environment needed to host hundreds of people from around the area and often from far away too. So people from his tribe and from other local tribes and from more distant tribes. The guests would all bring gifts, some quite substantial So everything the chief had put into making this event happen, he knew he would potentially get back and then some. Everything I've mentioned about the almost governmental type strand of these potlatches would occur. Schools would be settled, trading would take place, punishments would be meted out and higher status would be conferred on individuals who had meaningfully contributed to the community in some way. Another strand to these feasts was the singing of songs, in particular brand new songs especially written for the event, new releases. There was basically a songwriting and song performance competition. Anyone could join in, old or young, female or male, even if you were of low status perhaps of slave status or a captive or a criminal or an outcast, you could join in. If people liked your song enough, you could even be released from slavery or absolved of your crimes and become a free person. In some situations where maybe a chief's power was waning, you could sing your song with the intention of becoming a contender to become a chief. It was an all-in All or nothing competition. Winner takes it all. If your song was liked, if it caught the community's imagination, if people remembered it and wanted to sing it or wanted to hear you sing it again, you could become famous and wealthy. Your song could make you. It could make a name for you. If this is indeed true, and remember, I cannot find any confirmation or proof online, then I'd say... Not much has changed. It's still true today. The rags to riches scenario. That if you write just one good song and it captures the public's attention, 
then you are potentially made for life and doors that were once closed to you will open. 